In tonight's red and blue political roundup, Brett Kavanaugh's symbolic swearing in Monday was made political, if it wasn't already, as the president defended the newest Supreme Court justice. On behalf of our nation, I want to apologize to Brett and the entire Kavanaugh family for the terrible pain and suffering you have been forced to endure. Those who step forward to serve our country deserve a fair and dignified evaluation, not a campaign of political and personal destruction based on lies and deception. What happened to the Kavanaugh family violates every notion of fairness, decency, and due process. Kavanaugh's judicial oath was given by retiring Justice Anthony Kennedy during a symbolic ceremony at the White House. Kavanaugh will fill Kennedy's vacated seat starting on Tuesday. Now, demonstrators both in favor of and against Kavanaugh's appointment rallied across the country this weekend. The bitter confirmation fight, of course, has heightened tensions in Washington and beyond ahead of the midterms. Sean Sullivan is a congressional reporter at The Washington Post, joins us now from Washington. Uh, Sean, I trust you were watching this uh, fascinating, interesting, somewhat surprising ceremony in the East Room of the White House. Um, the president, uh, as, as we already saw, uh, made it a bit of a political event. I think we have another piece of sound. Uh, let's listen to the president again. We are indebted to Senator Susan Collins for her brave and eloquent speech and her declaration that when passions are most inflamed, fairness is most in jeopardy. How true, how true. Kavanaugh was conciliatory, but the president less so. What did you make of this half hour in the East Room? Yeah, it was, a, it was a fascinating half hour, Brooke. I mean, the president had an opportunity now, with Kavanaugh confirmed and on the court, to move beyond uh, some of the partisan back and forth that we saw uh, over the last few weeks play out in this confirmation, but uh, in a style that is very much the style the president has used over and over again and used as a candidate. Um, he doesn't want to let things go, and we heard that from him. Uh, we heard him try to remind the American people of what he saw as a partisan attack attack against Judge Kavanaugh. And so, rather than sort of move forward and try to strike a tone of unity, uh, it was a tone, really, that reminded people of the divisions that this nomination fight caused and has still uh, had, you know, widespread ramifications, not only in Congress, but across the country as, as we get ready for the midterm elections, which are just a few weeks away. Right. And, and a lot of Republicans, not just the president, seem to think, and this might be counterintuitive to some, but many seem to think that this ugly process and the way it happened could actually be good for Republicans. Mitch McConnell also on this point, and I think we have sound from him. I was talking to two of my political advisors yesterday about the advantage that these guys, by their tactics, have given to us going into these red state competitive races. And uh, we're pretty excited. We, they, they managed to deliver the only thing we had not been able to figure out how to do, which was to get our folks fired up. Uh, what exactly did they deliver? Why are they so fired up in McConnell's view? Well, when you look at the battle for the Senate majority that's going to unfold in the next few weeks and it's going to be decided uh, on November 6th, it's playing out in a lot of really, really conservative states, places like North Dakota, West Virginia, Indiana, and Missouri. And what Republicans have indeed struggled with for a while is how do we get our core supporters out? How do we get voters who supported President Trump enthusiastically in 2016 but are thinking, you know, I'm not so sure about voting uh, this fall, Trump's not on the ballot? They believe now they have landed on something that's really going to fire the base up and that they can go to voters in the final four weeks here and remind them and say, hey, we delivered something that President Trump wanted, that he sought, that he campaigned on, and that was this Supreme Court nomination and, and confirmation. And so they feel like they finally have something concrete that will play to conservative voters who voted for Trump in 2016 and who are they, who they are hoping will vote in places that we talked about, like Missouri, Indiana, West Virginia and North Dakota. It's a different picture in the House, of course. You have a lot of suburban swing districts. This could actually end up being a net negative for Republicans in the battle for the House. But from McConnell's perspective, this is good news A negative because it doesn't play as well in those districts? 
Yeah, and we're talking about a lot of districts where Trump is not popular, where there aren't as many conservative voters. And so this kind of divisive, polarizing politics, not going to play to Republicans' advantage there. If anything, it could play to Democrats' advantage. But again, in the red states, Republicans feel good about what this does to their base. They feel like it will excite them in a way that they haven't been excited uh, so far, at least, in the primaries and in the special elections that we've seen so far. Uh, one Republican, of course, famously, notably... Uh, did not vote for Kavanaugh, Lisa Murkowski of Alaska. And you wrote uh, a fairly lengthy piece in The Washington Post over the weekend about how she reached that decision, what the decision means for her. Um, she has a target on her back now, uh, as, as we've seen. Talk a bit about her role in this process in her future. Well, Lisa Murkowski was always seen as somebody who might vote for Kavanaugh, might vote against him. From the day that his nomination was made, she was always seen as a swing voter. But in the end, she was the only Republican who said, you know what, I'm not going to vote for him. There were other Republicans who were on the fence going into the closing days, Susan Collins, who, of course, President Trump mentioned tonight. Uh, Jeff Flake was another one who's retiring. But in the end, all the Republicans got in line. And so she will stand out in history as the only Republican member of the Senate who did not vote for Kavanaugh. President Trump, in an interview with one of my colleagues over the weekend, uh, said that her voters are not going to forget about this. So she does have a target on her back. Sarah Palin was tweeting over yep. the weekend, suggesting that she might run against her in the I future. I can see 2022 from my porch. Exactly. And so she is now going to be this this vote is going to define her uh, in many ways uh, in her political career going forward. Now, uh, you know, you talk to Democrats, people on the left, centrist Republicans, even some of them, and they say this is a good thing. This is something that will uh, generate support for Lisa Murkowski beyond the Republican Party. Uh, but on the flip side, you hear conservatives saying, you know, you're going to have to get through a primary uh, if you ever want to run again for any office, and uh, this could be a liability for her. So a really fascinating development. The, the key here is that she really she was the only one, and people will remember that uh, more strongly because there weren't any other Republicans who decided to vote against Kavanaugh. Um, and while all this politics happens on the international scene, we're starting to see what, what some folks have predicted for a long time, which is a true break between China and the U.S. Uh, and Secretary Pompeo uh, has been in China uh, meeting with them. And this is the first time uh, that a high-ranking American official has met uh, with China since the, the White House allegations of election meddling, uh, since some interesting reporting about uh, how China has, uh, has hacked um, parts of uh, U.S. tech. Uh, what do we know about this meeting and what do we know about the evolving nature of U.S.-China relations? Well, from everything we've seen, the relationship is uh, very, very testy right now. It has been trending toward a negative place now for a while. Uh, we talk about disagreements uh, over trade, over tariffs. Um, this is a relationship that has not been trending in a positive direction. And from the perspective of the White House and the administration, that's got to be a troubling sign because they want to work with China. They want to work with China on uh, North Korea and de denuclearizing North Korea. They feel like that's something that the two countries can work together on. But when it comes to trade, when it comes to economic issues, when it comes to uh, some of the things that the Chinese government has really gotten upset about, uh, this relationship is not going strongly right now. And, of course, there are accusations flying the president, um, you know, accusing the government of, of, uh, of interfering in, in the election. And so this is not uh, a, a strong relationship right now by any measure. And that's what we saw play out. So we've seen play out uh, with uh, Secretary Terry Pompeo on this trip. Okay, Sean Sullivan down in Washington. Thanks so much. Thanks, Brooke.